So I'm pleased to introduce Tom Cornish, uh, who is coming from Oxford. He's a postdoc at Oxford, and he's working on developing novel methods for uh, the mitigation of systematics in galaxy clustering uh, in LSST-based studies. And before this, he was a PhD student at the University, University of Lancaster uh, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Julie uh, Wardlow. And his thesis was on the environments of extreme star formation forming systems across cosmic time. And that's what we're going to hear about today. So thank you for coming and thank you for visiting us and uh, we can get started. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Tom. Um, and as, as Michael just said today, I'm going to be talking about the work that I did during my PhD uh, at Lancaster. It's all about the environments of extreme star forming galaxies across cosmic time. And this talk is divided into three three parts. First, I'll use to set up the background and introduce my work in context. Um, and then part two will be about this narrowband study that uh, we conducted to investigate the environments of submillimeter galaxies. And part three, uh, I'll use to talk about work I've been doing as part of the RAGES collaboration, um, in which we've uh, conducted a submillimeter study of the environments of massive radio quiet galaxies. And um, the work from this second second part is in a paper that's just been submitted to MUNRAS, uh, so uh, if you're interested, then watch this space. And then uh, the work in this third part is just awaiting final co-author uh, review before uh, before submission. And I'd like to take a minute to just say that uh, none of this work would have been possible without uh, the excellent Dr. Dewey Wardlow, who was my PhD supervisor at Lancaster. Um, so, a bit of background. Um, so I'm gonna begin this talk about extreme star forming systems by talking about systems that we know not to not to form stars uh, rapidly, um, but I promise it will make sense in context. Um, so in the local universe, we know that elliptical galaxies um, can display uh, a wide a wide array of masses, although they're predominantly, uh, they're typically, typically much more massive than their uh, spiral counterparts. Um, and we know that they're uh, generally poor uh, they, have, they have very little gas and dust, having depleted all of it uh, at some point in the in the past, and consequently, consequently, this leads to them having low star formation rates, um, which in turn means that they have old stellar populations compared to their uh, late type counterparts, uh, spiral galaxies. Um, and finally, we know that in the local universe we see this morphology uh, density relation by which elliptical galaxies are typically found in dense galaxy environments such as galaxy clusters. Uh, while spiral galaxies typically occupy regions of average or even low galaxy density. And so um, elliptical galaxy formation is still something of a mystery. Um, despite often being referred to as early type galaxies, they, we actually think they represent a late, later stage of galaxy evolution, um, where we believe that the environment within which they reside plays a significant role owing to this morphology density relation that we see. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, those environments are typically galaxy clusters. And to steal a line from just about every cluster paper ever written, um, galaxy clusters, in case you didn't know, are the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe, containing hundreds or even thousands of galaxies within a single uh, single virialized dark matter halo. Um, again, these galaxies are predominantly elliptical, the brightest of which imaginatively called the brightest cluster galaxy. Um, these are typically some of the most massive elliptical galaxies in the universe. And so in the context of uh, elliptical galaxy evolution, it's clear that environment must play some significant role in shaping them. Um, and a lot of work has been done in recent years to try and understand the mechanisms by which this occurs, um, including interactions with the hot intracluster medium or interactions with other galaxies within the environment uh, through, for example, mergers. So it's clear that elliptical galaxy formation is something of a tangled mess that needs to be needs to be unraveled in some way. Um, observationally, in the in the local universe, we can try our best to observe these galaxies and infer from what we see how how they could have possibly evolved. But at some point, it helps to extend the search to higher redshift and look at um, look at the the conditions that may have given rise to them in the past. And then there are sort of two schools, if you like, by which you could you could do this. One is to 
try and identify galaxies that you believe to be the direct progenitors of elliptical, ga elliptical galaxies um, and try and try and observe those at higher redshift. And if you're lucky, see the processes in play um, that result in elliptical galaxy formation. Or you can um, you can use the fact that elliptical galaxies are typically found in clusters and try and search for the progenitors of these cluster uh, of these clusters. Of course, these two schools are inherently linked, and in some ways it's impossible to do one without doing the other. But to start with, I'll focus on this search for progenitor environments. These progenitors are called uh, galaxy protoclusters, of which there isn't really a standardized definition, but one that's generally accepted is that they're high redshift structures that will collapse and be realized to form galaxy clusters before the present day. Um, these structures are typically characterized by overdensities of uh, generally star-forming galaxies. And unlike in galaxy clusters, these galaxies don't occupy a single virilized halo. There could be many halos involved, um, leading to uh, extended, sometimes filamentary structures like the ones shown in this simulation. So how do we hunt for galaxy protoclusters? Um, well, it turns out that the traditional methods for searching for galaxy clusters uh, are rendered somewhat impractical uh, for protoclusters, mostly owing to the fact that they aren't in one big virilized halo. Um, they don't possess a, a hot intracluster medium, so we can't rely on X-ray emission or the sunyev zeldovich effect, for example. And the galaxies in these environments are typically less evolved than you would find in clusters, and so we don't see a tight red sequence in color magnitude space like you would expect for local clusters. Instead, searchers have to rely on looking for uh, just over densities of galaxies, pretty much. And this can be quite a daunting task, especially if you're thinking about so surveying the whole sky and looking for regions that happen to be more, more over dense. But um, it's now known there are, there are certain populations of galaxies that can be used as signposts of, of these over densities. Um, one such signpost is uh, this category of high redshift radio galaxies, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about uh, shortly. And one example is the spider web galaxy uh, shown here, which is um, known to reside, it's a high redshift radio galaxy known to reside in a significant overdensity of other star forming galaxies, which is now known as the spider web protocluster. So moving on to the other school of thought, how can we search for the, the direct progenitors of elliptical galaxies? And to that, we can turn to um, theoretical models for how we think elliptical galaxies uh, may form, uh, one of which is presented very nicely in Hopkins et al. 2008, which I've uh, pasted here. Um, with this model, we begin in the bottom left with isolated disk galaxies, which uh, occupy their own uh, dark matter halos, and ultimately through gravitational attraction, will find themselves uh, part of a small group of other disk galaxies. Following this, the dark matter halos of those galaxies will, will merge and subsequent interactions will cause the galaxies to lose angular momentum and ultimately coalesce themselves. This coalescence then triggers a violent uh, burst of star formation in what we call the Ulerg phase, um, during which gas flows into the center uh, of the galaxy, fueling this burst of star formation while simultaneously fueling the central black hole. This black hole then sort of reaches its secretion limit and then begins to expel gas and dust from the host galaxy um, and briefly dominates the, the, the emission, emission from the galaxy. Um, but this phase is short-lived as the galaxy quickly runs out of fuel to, um, to accrete onto the black hole and to fuel star formation. And ultimately it uh, fades rapidly and reddens until we end up with a, a passive or dead elliptical. And this model quite nicely lays out some of the intermediate population of galaxies that we could search for when looking for elliptical progenitors. Um, one I'm going to focus on right now is this ULERG phase. Uh, so ULERGs are uh, ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. Um, as the name suggests, they are very high rest frame infrared luminosities, and they possess a uh, large amounts of dust and cold gas. Um, and this dust is responsible for um, the sort of characteristic SED shape that we see for ULEGs. Uh, this example is called ARP220. Um, and what we see is that dust from newly formed stars 
And these new stars are formed at impressive rates of hundreds or even thousands of solar masses per year. We see that light from these stars gets absorbed by uh, dust in the blue sort of uh, optical UV regime, and then it gets re-radiated in the infrared regime, giving this characteristic black body-like dust uh, emission spectrum. Um, incidentally, we also know that these galaxies are typically quite massive, having stellar masses on the order of 10 to the 11 uh, solar masses. And in the local universe, these galaxies are rare. They contribute very little, so less than 3% to the total uh, star formation rate density in the local universe. But it turns out that this picture changes as we go to higher redshift, as was uh, discovered um, after the first submillimeter surveys were completed. So these submillimeter surveys revealed a previously hidden population of galaxies, now known as submillimeter galaxies. Um, which are principally detected in the submillimeter regime being faint in, um, in the optical UV regime. Uh, intrinsically, these, are, uh, these appear to be very similar to ULURGs, having extremely high star formation rates and large amounts of dust. Um, the, their redshift distribution is thought to peak at around redshift 2.5, but with a high redshift tail extending out to around redshift 6. And it turns out that their detection at higher redshifts is aided by what we call a negative K correction, which is illustrated in this bottom right panel where I've taken the ARP220 SED and uh, essentially redshifted it, uh, going from purple to red, where we can see that the flux density, uh, while decreasing as 1 over R squared, um, this SED also shifts to the right so that the peak of the dust emission ends up in the submillimeter regime, um, effectively mitigating this effect of the light dimming due to distance. Um, and thanks to thanks for all this, we've uh, found many, many SMGs at high redshift, and we believe that they're a much more significant population than their low redshift counterparts, the ULURGs, contributing as much as 20% to the total star formation rate density at redshift of around two. So if these are high redshift analogs of ULURGs, how do they fare as candidate progenitors uh, of elliptical galaxies? Well, there have been many clustering studies done. Well, it's the same many. There have been clustering studies done on SMGs to try and assess sort of the typical dark matter halo mass that they reside in. Um, and they reveal that SMGs typically occupy dark matter halos that are seemingly consistent with um, halos that will eventually evolve to host uh, two to three L-star elliptical galaxies. Um, but these clustering studies come with caveats, namely that many of them rely on single dish submillimeter observations. Um, single dish observations are great for covering large areas, but they're often, uh, especially in the submillimeter, susceptible to poor PSFs, which result in source blending, um, which can bias your clustering results. And furthermore, photometric redshift estimates are often challenging for these submillimeter galaxies, um, partly because of this blending, but also because um, the dust emission can be quite difficult to constrain with standard uh, SED fitting. Um, so these single dish studies have their own have their own caveats. Um, clustering studies have been attempted using interferometers such as ALMA, um, where you effectively take field of view and mosaic it across large areas of sky but these are difficult to obtain uniform coverage with, uh, which again can bias your clustering results if not accounted for properly. And finally, these clustering studies can only provide a picture of the SMG population as a whole, and so don't tell us about you know, individual cases in any detail. Meanwhile, SMGs have been observed in protocluster-like environments before, um, and that lends credence to the theory that they could be the progenitors of ellipticals, um, however, these uh, existing samples of SMGs and protoclusters are inherently biased towards overdense environments because uh, a lot of the time the submillimeter observations are requested as follow-up to an already uh, already existing signs of an overdensity. Um, so to date, we still don't really know what the typical SMG environment is like. At this point, I'm going to mention BCGs separately, uh, brightest cluster galaxies, because these are thought to be somewhat special among the elliptical population. Um, they're thought to form quite late in the universe's history, um, owing to how structure forms hierarchically uh, in the Lambda CDM universe. 
Um, however, it's believed that most of their stellar content is in place before redshifts of around two, which suggests that their formation history is dominated by uh, dry gas pore mergers after this time. And this is represented by this merger tree on the right, where after a look back time of about 6 billion years, the mergers that make up this BCG are dominated by red uh, passive galaxies um, and trigger very little sort of star formation in the process of those merging, implying that they're gas poor. Um, another property of BCGs is that they're more generally more likely to host radio loud AGN than other galaxies of similar mass, which is an especially pertinent point um, when we consider that uh, one of the top current top candidate progenitors for BCGs are these high redshift radio galaxies that I mentioned briefly before. And these high redshift radio galaxies are massive and host uh, radio loud AGN. Um, and K-band observations of these galaxies imply that they have uh, old stellar populations, although many of them also show signs of ongoing star formation as inferred from their UV spectra and dust emission. Um, and so all of this implies that high retro radio galaxies also have complex merger histories, um, which in turn also kind of supports the idea that they could be BCG progenitors. And as I mentioned before, they're often found in galaxy overdensities, um, proto clusters at high redshift. But one of the open questions that I want to point out is that it's currently unknown whether this tendency to reside in proto clusters is driven by their inherently high stellar masses or whether there's some interplay with the radio loud AGN. So that brings me on to the two main outstanding questions I want to address with the rest of this talk. The first is what is the typical environment of a submillimeter galaxy and is it consistent with uh, proto clusters? Um, and the second is do radio quiet galaxies that are similarly massive to high retro radio galaxies also reside in similar over densities? Um, so to answer that first question, uh, we conducted a narrowband survey of submillimeter galaxy environments, which I'll talk about now. So the aim of this survey was to measure the environments of individual submillimeter galaxies in a way that isn't biased towards overdense environments. Um, to do this, we use narrowband imaging from Hawkeye on the VLT to search for overdensities of star forming galaxies around individual SMGs at redshifts of two to three. And here at the bottom, I've just shown how the Hawkeye field of view compares to the sort of expected extent of protoclusters of different uh, masses. And um, what we see is that we can we can cover a, an appreciable fraction of the of the protocluster without risking going so wide as to have that overdensity smoothed out by field galaxies. Um, so for this survey, we selected SMGs from the ALS sample where ALS is an ALMA follow-up study to the Laboka ECDFS submillimeter survey, lots of acronyms within acronyms, which is something I personally hate, but um, um, this ALS uh, survey ultimately produced a catalog of 131 SMGs, uh, many of which have since, uh, many of which now have spectroscopic redshifts owing to um, follow-up studies. So with these spectroscopic redshifts at hand, we selected six ALS SMGs for this study based purely on those redshifts because those redshifts were compatible with strong emission lines from coeval star forming galaxies shifting into the coverage of this narrow bracket gamma filter. And this bracket gamma filter also sits very nicely within the coverage of uh, the Hawkeye's KS band, which enables us to search for emission line galaxies through excess brightness in the narrow band filter. Just to visualize what that would look like in the images, here's a, a narrowband image where I've circled a galaxy that we uh, know to be an emission line galaxy. And we can see that in the broadband, this galaxy is practically uh, invisible. Um, and if we take the residuals of these two images, narrowband minus broadband, emission line galaxies will appear as bright spots uh, here. Um, so as I said, we chose six SMGs because of their redshifts being compatible with this idea. Um, unfortunately, due to time constraints and the COVID-19 pandemic, only three of them ended up observed, which unfortunately cut our sample in half. Um, but still, still enough to work with for the sake of the study. Uh, and it turns out that two of these SMGs uh, conveniently occupy one, uh, one, one pointing, um, where one is at redshift 2.3 and the other at 3.3, and the third SMG is in its own, own pointing. 
So how do we quantitatively identify uh, emission line galaxies? Uh, to do this, we use color magnitude diagrams where uh, the y-axis is the difference between the broadband and the narrowband magnitudes. Um, and the x-axis is just narrowband magnitudes. And the selection criteria that we employ um, originate from a study done by Andy Bunker in 1995, where we uh, apply two criteria. One uh, uses the equivalent width that an emission line would have to have to produce the observed color, um, which can be estimated from the observed flux densities and the widths of the filters. And the second parameter is this sigma, which essentially parameterizes the significance of the narrowband excess compared to random scatter that you would see for galaxies with zero color. Um, and this depends on the observed magnitudes in each filter, as well as the local noise properties uh, of the image. Um, <laughs> after applying these selection criteria and doing visual checks of uh, each one to rule out any stars or artifacts, uh, we're left with 79 candidate emission line galaxies in one pointing and 68 in the other. Of course, that isn't enough to identify um, HR4O3 emitters specifically. For that, you need redshift information. Um, and so to do that, we made use of archival images from uh, surveys that cover the wider region of sky within which our Hawkeye pointings are contained. Uh, this region is called the ECDFS. Um, and we use images from studies such as music, tennis, and simple, uh, which uh, together cover uh, cover photometric bands ranging from the U band to eight microns. Um, so we extracted our own fixed aperture photometry from these images and fed them into Easy Pi, which is a Pythonic version of the uh, photometric redshift code Easy, um, using anywhere between five and thirty six filters to fit those SEDs per source. Um, and having done having done that, we apply uh, selection cuts um, to the to the redshift distribution to select specifically H alpha emitters that we then assume are associated with the redshift two point three SMGs or O three emitters that are associated with the one red uh, one SMG at redshift three point three. Um, these cuts are based on the on the width of the narrowband filter essentially. Um, and so ultimately we find 44 H alpha emitters associated with one SMG, 11 associated with the other at two point, redshift 2.3, and four O3 emitters associated with this redshift 3.3 uh, SMG. Um, so now we wanted to try and determine whether these environments are consistent with protoclusters, i.e. are they overdense with respect to the blank field? Uh, to do that, we constructed luminosity functions and compared with uh, luminosity functions for the blank field obtained as part of the high redshift emission line survey, uh, HISELS, which I believe Jim was heavily involved in. Um, and HISELS produced luminosity functions for, uh, conveniently for us, H alpha emitters at similar redshift to our SMGs and O3 emitters at, again, a similar redshift to one of our SMGs. So broadly, the process of constructing these luminosity functions involves estimating the emission line flux using the observed flux densities and the filter widths, um, converting this line flux into a luminosity, uh, binning, binning the sources by this luminosity, and then fitting Schechter functions uh, to those bins. Um, these Schechter functions are parameterized by you know, three parameters, we've got phi star, which is essentially a normalization factor that shifts it up or down, alpha, which describes the slope at the faint end, and L star, which tells you where this curve stops being dominated by power law and instead starts being dominated by this exponential cutoff. Um, because we're only working with relatively few sources, um, and therefore we, we can only use a few bins, we we don't let alpha vary and instead fix it to the blank field values. Otherwise we end up with very high amounts of uncertainty. Oops. Um, there are some intermediate steps that I brushed over and I won't go into too much detail unless people have questions at the end, but um, those intermediate steps include correcting for potential contamination from other emission lines, for example, H alpha sits right in the middle of a, a doublet of emission lines from N2, 
Um, so we, we attempt to correct for contamination from that. Uh, we also apply completeness corrections to account for the fact that we're likely missing uh, faint sources. And uh, finally, we apply a correction to our estimate of the, the volume that we're probing, um, making use of the shape of the narrowband filter. So I'll build up these luminosity functions gradually. We start with the blank field luminosity functions from Heisel's. Um, it's worth noting that in Sobral et al. 2013, they correct their H alpha line luminosities for dust using a constant uh, correction. Um, and they also correct for this N2 contamination that I just mentioned. So we, for the sake of comparison, attempt to do uh, exactly the same when we make our luminosity functions. Um, but meanwhile, Costa Van et al. 2015 don't apply a dust correction. And they also apply this sort of a volume correction to account for the fact that they might be picking up H beta emitters as well as O3. Um, so again, we try and do exactly the same uh, or the closest analog that we can with our data. Um, so here we can see uh, the results for, uh, on the left, if we consider both of the SMGs at redshift 2.3 uh, at the same time, we see that on average, there's perhaps signs of an signs of overdensity relative to the blank field based on how this function sits above the blank field uh, results. Uh, for O3, um, we only had four sources to work with, which fell into fell into one bin. And so uh, um, rather than rather than try and fit fit a Schechter function in full, we just we essentially scale up the blank field results um, until it fits our data point, which is effectively the same as keeping both alpha and L star fixed rather than just alpha. And then finally, I'll just show here what happens if we consider the two SMGs at Reg of 2.3 separately. Um, one of them, ALS 75.2, seems to display uh, a potentially significant overdensity compared to the blank field, while ALS 102.1 is maybe more consistent with the blank field because these data points scatter uh, above and below. Um, so how do we quantify the, the galaxy overdensity? You can make use of this uh, overdensity parameter, delta G, where this is essentially the number of galaxies that you observe divided by the expected number from the blank field and then subtracted by one. For, uh, for this uh, N obs, we use, we essentially sum over all the bins from our luminosity function. Um, and for N field, we take the blank field luminosity function integrate it and multiply by the uh by the volume that we that we are probing and then the sign of this delta g parameter will tell you if a region is over dense or under dense essentially so doing that calculation we end up with these values for delta g um we can see that ALS 7 5.2 um, and ALS 5.1 reside in over densities of about one one to two sigma significance while ALS 102.1, as expected, doesn't seem to reside in a, uh, as expected based on the luminosity functions, it doesn't seem to reside in an overdensity. Uh, and again, if we take the average of the two SMGs at ratio 2.3, on average, there is an overdensity signal of about two sigma. Um, so far, we haven't considered how these galaxies are distributed on the sky, so uh, let's consider that now. Um, blue crosses in these panels represent the positions of the H alpha emitters that we believe to be associated with the two SMGs at redshift 2.3. Um, and pink crosses are the O3 emitters that we believe to be associated with this redshift 3.3 SMG. We can see that in this pointing, the H alpha emitters and you know, possibly the O3 emitters, although it's difficult to tell with only four, they seem distributed across, across the Hawkeye pointing. But in this pointing, there seems to be a smaller scale clustering going on around the SMG. Um, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed this dense clump of H alpha emitters in the northeast. Um, we've done our best to verify that this is in fact real. There are actually a bunch of galaxies here and not, not just an artifact. Um, so yeah, we're reasonably convinced that this, this exists and three of those galaxies are spectroscopically confirmed as well. Um, so another way to look at this is if we take that distribution of H alpha emitters and smooth it with a Gaussian kernel, um, where we can more easily see where the peaks in this uh, in the density uh, lie. So as before, we've got in this pointing 
distribution across almost the entire pointing with the significant peak here and two smaller peaks, uh, one of which is associated with the SMG. Whereas with this other pointing, there's only really one peak um, and it's limited to essentially one quadrant of the pointing. And looking at how the density compares to the blank field, this is quite a significant overdensity. It was just missed when we did our luminosity functions because those functions considered the entire pointing. Um, so we then went on to recalculate delta G taking into account only this quadrant. Um, and we find that delta G uh, increases significantly. And now we see that this galaxy resides in an over density of about two sigma. So these results suggest that all three of our SMGs would potentially reside in overdense protocluster-like regions, um, although one of them just happens to be on a small physical scale. Um, but at the moment, we still don't know if these uh, are quote-unquote true protoclusters, i.e. will they evolve into clusters by the present day? Um, and so the final, and as it turns out, most ambitious goal uh, of this uh, study was to estimate the total mass of each overdensity um, and try and deduce the descendant, the mass of the descendant structure. We do this using two methods, which we call the SHMR method, which employs a stellar to halo mass relation, uh, and the SEM method, which uses a spherical collapse model to estimate the halo mass. So the SHMR method begins by taking the stellar mass of the most massive galaxy in each environment, which we estimate um, using more SED fitting, this time using MAGFIS. Um, we take that stellar mass, feed it into a stellar to halo mass relation from Beruzi et al. 2013, and get an estimate of the halo mass of the structure at the redshift of the, uh, of the SMG. Uh, we then use a mass accretion rate formula from the Millennium simulations, uh, as presented in Fakuri et al. 2010, to track the evolution of this halo mass to the present day. Meanwhile, the SEM method uses this delta G parameter that we've already calculated, along with some estimate of what we call the galaxy bias, which essentially tells you how a given population of galaxies clusters relative to the dark matter in the universe. Uh, for this, we make use of um, results from another Heisel's paper, Cochrane et al. 2017. Um, and we, we feed that into this equation, which gives what we call the, the matter over density parameter. This then goes into the spherical collapse model equation, which is presented in Steidel et al. 1998, um, which gives a present day estimate of the halo mass, taking into account the mean co-moving matter density of the universe, the co-moving volume of your structure, and this matter over density parameter calculated here. We then take that present day mass estimate, feed it into the same mass accretion rate formula as before, but this time tracking backwards in time to get the halo mass estimates at the uh, SMG redshifts. So now I'll show you how those compare to the uh, masses of known clusters and protoclusters, um, as well as uh, this gray band, which shows the expected evolution of a coma-like galaxy cluster. Uh, and these hatched regions represent the results from various uh, clustering studies done with SMGs. So if we look at the SHMR method, we get extremely high masses for all three of these SMGs, SMG environments, which if tracked to the present day, evolve into uh, structures that are greater even than the coma cluster, which is one of the biggest uh, clusters that we know of in the local universe. Um, this doesn't seem very plausible. Um, we reckon this is probably due to systematics and the method and the assumptions going into it, uh, which I can explain in more detail if people want. Um, but we we treat these mass estimates as upper limits just because uh, they seem very high. Um, meanwhile, the SEM method gives a much broader and lower uh, mass range for each of these each of these structures, implying that at least two of them could evolve into galaxy clusters by the present day, uh, while the third um, the present day halo mass is potentially too low for that, but is more consistent with the with a galaxy group, for example. And incidentally, these results are seemingly more consistent with SMG clustering studies. And since we don't really know which of these mass estimates gives uh, gives a better estimate, they each have their own assumptions going into them. Um, we we sort of treat them as upper and lower bounds of an effective mass range. Of course, this means there's a very high level of uncertainty 
But even with this high level uncertainty, it seems that uh, these SMG environments may well evolve into galaxy clusters, or at the very least, galaxy groups, um, which in turn supports, uh, essentially supports the theory that SMGs are the progenitors of massive elliptical galaxies in local clusters um, and all local groups. Um, so those are the conclusions for that part. I'm happy to take any questions now if people want to ask them. Otherwise, we can wait until the end. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> In the previous slide about the uh, narrowband line contaminations, could you just expand upon the um, process you use to uh, in, in Oh, sorry, with the luminosity functions. Yes. Yeah. So, um, oh, I won't skip to it. But the the process that we use essentially in um, a paper by Sabral et al. I think it was his 2015 paper. He looked at uh, um, how using resolved spectra, he looked at what the what the expected contribution from N2 is for on, on average for a sample of galaxies. Right. And so um, it turns out there's an empirical relation that he derived for for that sample where this, this contamination from N2 happens to scale with your H alpha line flux. And so we we use that linear relation to to correct for, for N2. Uh, yeah. Small question. Did you try the SHM modulation evolves with redshift as well? Yes. So did you try going rather than going from the method of using the emergent version from millennium and then calculating the bigger mass just during the evolution of SHM from the Hibuzi itself? Yeah, no, we didn't. We didn't actually try that. That's a good point. It seems to be that the estimate of the mass at the redshift of the SMG is too high, right? Mm -hmm. The rate of evolution thereafter. Quite well matched with the observation. So I don't think it's the millennium part of that process. Yeah. No, that's true. It's not, but we understand it will be easier to understand some systematics where it's, it's coming from, like, like which part of SGMR is it uh, coming from, like, the estimates, where is it going along? No, that's a very good point. Yeah, no, we haven't considered that, but thank you. That's very useful. Um, were there any other questions? Yeah. 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 That's a good point. There was, we were we were basing our method off um a paper by Ariana Long in 2020, which also used the Spray Rizzi 2013 mm -hmm. uh, relation, and um, whether whether they were aware of the Spray Rizzi 19, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, if that's everything, we'll move on to the final part of this talk, which uh, you may be relieved to hear is much shorter than this part. Um, so yeah, I'm going to use the last few minutes to talk about work I've been doing as part of the RAGES uh, collaboration, in which we conducted a sub millimeter study of the environments of massive radio quiet galaxies. So just to um, reiterate some of the motivation behind this, we we know from observations that high retro radio galaxies typically reside in uh, over dense protocluster like regions at high redshift, um, and as a result, are uh, considered strong candidates for the progenitors of BCGs. However, what we don't really know for certain is whether this tendency to reside in protoclusters is driven by their inherently high stellar mass, or whether there's some interplay going on with the radio loud AGM. Um, moreover, most of the over densities that have been identified around high redshift radio galaxies have been done using traces of unobscured star formation such as Lyman alpha and H alpha, much like the study I just talked to you about. Um, however, we, we know that obscured star formation makes up a significant fraction of the uh, star formation rate density at high redshift. So in order to get a complete picture and fully understand what's going on, what we, what we need is submillimeter environment studies of both high redshift radio galaxies and similarly massive radio quiet galaxies um, in order to sort of disentangle the possible possible causes driving driving all of this. Um, and that's precisely the aim of RAGES, which is a slightly contrived acronym of the Radio Galaxy Environment Reference Survey. Uh, this is PI'd by Thomas Grieve, who's currently at DTU in uh, Denmark. And um, the aims of RAGES are essentially as follows. Using SCUBA2 on JCMT, 
we want to search for SMGs in the environments of a reasonably a statistical sample of high redshift of radio galaxies um, at redshift one to three and a half. And on the right here, I've just shown the stellar masses and redshifts of the radio sample in comparison to contours representing galaxies in the Cosmos 2020 catalog. And so you can see that these high redshift radio galaxies represent quite an extreme population uh, at, at a given epoch. Um, with this, we want to measure the SMG density in, in the environments of these high redshift radio galaxies and compare with the SMG density in environments of radio quiet galaxies that have been matched in uh, redshift and stellar mass. And this study in particular focuses on this, this final component, looking at radio quiet galaxies. So to do this, we first have to identify galaxies with similar redshifts and stellar masses to the radio sample. Uh, we do this using Cosmos 2020. And this plot on the right shows with green boxes the selection criteria that we apply. Um, we then use results from VLA Cosmos to remove any galaxies that have been flagged as moderate to high luminosity AGN. Uh, we do this to minimize the risk of um, any, any radio loud galaxies of slipping into our sample by mistake. Um, and then finally, we, we require decent submillimeter coverage. So we limit ourselves to regions of the uh, S2 Cosmos survey footprint, which was a scuba two survey of the Cosmos field. Um, we limit ourselves to areas where the mean flux density the mean RMS flux density is less than 1.3 milligalactics per beam. And the pink dots in this panel uh, show all of the radio quiet analog galaxies that make it into our sample. And these range from anywhere between, I think it was 15 to 181 per radius radio loud galaxy. Thank you. Um, so unlike with the previous study, um, we don't have redshift information for for the galaxies we're trying to identify as companions, and therefore we can't use luminosity functions to measure the overdensity. Instead, we have to rely on the slightly more uh, old school method of submillimeter number counts, um, which are effectively analogous to luminosity functions, but using flux density rather than uh, luminosity. This limits, your, this limits you to looking for 2D overdensities rather than 3D overdensities, um, but it's still a somewhat effective means of identifying potential protoclusters. Um, these are often presented in one of two forms. Um, differential number counts effect essentially is uh, a Schechter function, as with the luminosity functions, where these parameters are completely analogous to the ones uh, from the luminosity function, or uh, the cumulative form, which is just the integral of this one with respect to flux density. Um, in this study, we look at both, but as we'll see, um, the results don't, don't change regardless of which form we use. Um, so to construct these number counts, we begin by randomly selecting one radio quiet analog galaxy for every high redshift radio galaxy in the radio sample. Um, and we then search for all SMGs within a fiducial radius of six arc minutes of the radio quiet analog. We then bin those SMGs by their 850 micron flux density as quoted in the S2 Cosmos catalog, um, applying uh, correctness corrections for completeness uh, as well as the area that we're surveying. Uh, we then repeat those first three steps 1,000 times, um, where each time we select, randomly select different radio quiet analogs for each radius galaxy. Uh, we then take the median of all of this and use those as the final number counts and fit Schechter functions or the integral thereof uh, to, to the resultant data. Essentially, what we find is that um, compared to the whole S2 Cosmos catalog, which, which we use as a, as a sort of blank field reference, um, we find that there's no significant difference between the environments of our radio quiet galaxies uh, in the submillimeter uh, and, the, and the blank field. And we find that this is true regardless of whether we allow all the parameters in the Schechter function to vary or whether we only scale the normalization. Um, we also find that this is true regardless of whether we look at the differential or the cumulative number counts. So before that was uh, differential and this is cumulative and still we see consistency with the blank field. And finally, we try this with different radii to make sure that, you know, six arc minutes is quite big. Maybe we're smoothing out the over densities. Um, even as we go to smaller radii, we see that it's consistent with the blank field, although 
Uh, I'm not going to hide the fact that these error bars do get quite large um, due to small number statistics. Um, so those that is the main result of that uh, that study. Um, just to summarize, we've measured the environments in submillimeter regime of massive radio quiet galaxies that are comparable in mass to high redshift radio galaxies at similar redshifts and find no significant difference uh, with respect to the blank field. Um, given that high redshift radio galaxies typically reside in proto clusters, and these proto clusters are often submillimeter galaxy rich. Um, it therefore seems like massive radio quiet galaxies are less likely to inhabit proto clusters at these redshifts, um, implying that the high stellar mass is not the driving factor of these radio galaxies residing in proto clusters, and that there must be some kind of interaction between the radio loud AGN and the surrounding wide field environment. Um, and with that, I'll leave you with my closing remarks and say thank you for listening. Uh, practice. Uh, and thanks, that was very interesting and to find the result very puzzling. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking about cosmological evolution. I don't know if you've looked at that, but if I look at cosmological models, um, is it is it easy to understand? I mean, you have galaxies of similar mass, but uh, they are in completely different environments. Uh, I, I'm thinking about a halo occupation models where mass and environments kind of link. So mm -hmm. can you understand that that you get similar massive galaxies in so different environments? Yeah, so one theory that's come from simulations um that I think potentially has some weight to it is that um these radio loud AGN in high redshift radio galaxies um are suppressing further star formation from happening in, in those galaxies. Um, so what happens is that instead of, instead of these galaxies forming more stars and having stellar masses that are ultimately compatible with these larger halo masses, um, the star formation is, uh, suppressed. So in terms of stellar mass, they appear, they, they appear the same as these radio quiet ones, but what's actually happened is that their halo mass has grown, their star formation has you know, tried to grow with it, but the, the AGN activity is suppressing any further growth. Right, so it really has to do something with the feedback. So yeah. if, you, if you switch off feedback in all cosmological models, then you would uh, expect similar environments for similar mass. I believe so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what was the standard mass range of these enriched Uh We're looking at um, around 10 to the 11, just, sorry, this is very slow. Too many GIFs. Uh, yeah, so, no, too far. Yeah, between 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 12. So without the, the radio mic feedback, they'd be really big. In theory, yeah. I, I would suggest the opposite. I would actually suggest that, um, so the mechanism that we know of is that um, uh, jet induced star formation. Mm -hmm. that, that the radio galaxies produce shocks that might trigger star formation. So you get brighter line and alpha emitters or whatever emitters you see in the in the surrounding field because the shock volume is triggering star formation. Mm -hmm. No, it does make sense. I thought positive AGM feedback was generally quite, quite rare. But that's, yeah. Very nice talk. Thank um, you. Nice to put a face to the name. Yeah. Um, could you say a bit more about this um, curious um, overdensity, tiny more overdensity on the top left around the... Yes. Which I know you've investigated a little bit more than you let on here. Yeah. I, think, um, I mean, I, I, in context of this stuff, um, I mean, it's kind of um, the, the. I wonder whether the, the kind of the spatial scale that you see for that that right. If you're, if you're looking at the environment of the of the of the of the structures of redshift, and you see the structure that's so much smaller than the kind of the spatial scale that you're assuming, mm. does that kind of mean anything for the 
for the way that you calculated the open density here or the smoothing that you might have done on the the optimal smoothing radius? Oh, excuse me. Yes, we, might, we did. We we kind of played around with the the smoothing <laughs> smoothing radius that we did. Ultimately, um, ultimately the smoothing doesn't go into the delta G calculation. That's purely um purely based on completeness corrected counts. Um, okay. Ultimately, this was just for visualization purposes and helped us identify that this peak even existed. Mm -hmm. But it would affect your delta G value, right? Mm -hmm. Pardon? It will affect your delta G value. The smoothing. I mean, in which, yeah, because if you take on the same point of class, unless you're unless you're using the whole page, but yeah. yeah, like if you take a 50 mega pass scale, your over density will be less pronounced compared to a five mega pass scale. Yeah, sure. Um. So when we did calculate the delta G value for this this environment uh, for this little, this quadrant, we we took the area of that quadrant alone, considered only the galaxies within that quadrant, and the the dimension along the, the redshift axis, that comes from from the filter profile uh, of the of the narrowband filter. Um, this sort of Smoothing with a Gaussian kernel doesn't enter the enter that calculation. Um, when you say that quadrant, is it like are you fixing what will be the pixel size within that? Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, but that will affect. Yeah, we we estimate the area of it using using the mask, which I didn't talk about the mask, but these hatched regions around the edges. These are regions between the between the quad quadrants of the detector and um areas where areas where bright objects such as stars contaminate the field by taking that mask and knowing the area of each pixel yeah yeah we we estimate it sorry a long-winded way of reaching the answer but yeah so could you say something more about this this yes weird confluence of line emitters yes so um it, That's the one. Yeah, there's about seven, yeah, seven H alpha emitters that tend to, that seem to occupy this approximately 20 by 20 arc second region. And it turns out that the position of this aligns uh, very well with the position of a Lyman alpha blob that was discovered in, um, in a paper by Yang et al. in 2010. Um, so we believe that these H alpha emitters are, are associated with this Lyman alpha blob. Um, we tried submitting a telescope proposal to get follow-up observations, but unfortunately, it wasn't successful in previous cycles. But we'll we'll try and try again. I think because it would be nice to get some a better idea of what's going on. Are these H alpha emitters fueling the Lyman alpha blob? Um, yeah, but that's essentially what that is. Any more questions? Comments? Um, so yeah, thank you, Tom. Thank you.